Hey, what's up guys? This is Dr. Islam speaking. I'm a DPT, I'm a neurology fellow, and also a neuro testing and needle AMD resident here in New York. And today we're gonna talk, I'm gonna talk to you about the median somatosensory evoked potentials, also commonly called median SSEPs. Um, it's it's gonna be it's a very big topic. It's gonna be in a several videos, but this is the part one of it. So actually, what is a somatosensory evoked potential? What is SSAPs? As you all know, that any sensory impulse should be interpreted that the human body, like in touch with the human body, should be interpreted inside the brain. SSAP is actually the measurement of the electrical activity of the signals that is produced inside the brain in response to outside stimulus, which is. Uh, electricity in case of, uh, of of SSAPs and just like any pathway for any sensory uh, uh, stimuli they the, the the at first the nerve will be stimulated and then it get, the signal will find its way up to the cord and it's gonna enter the cord through the dorsal root entry zone travel up through the in the dorsal colon through the cuneate nucleus to the cuneate nucleus and then in the brain stem it's gonna take a state to the other side where it's gonna find its way up to the thalamus there the, through the thalamocortical radiation it will find its way up to the primary somatosensory cortex so what SSEP actually measure is we measure the integrity of all of these parts any 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 pathology affected any part of the peripheral nerve, the dorsal root, the the ascending tracts, the brainstem, thalamus, or the primary somatosensory cortex itself, it, the SAP will pick it up. Of course, it's always better that if, if you do SAPs to start first doing EMGs and nerve conduction studies to rule out any pathology in the in the peripheral nerve so you don't get confused and you're able to just isolate the pathology in the central nervous system itself. So the clinical uses of it, it's used to probably diagnose any pathology of the, of the sensory system. It also v proved to be very efficient and effective to diagnose the follow-ups for any medications or surgeries. If you give any medication for the patient, you want to see if this is if we're on the right track or no, we can actually prove it or you know say no, it's not doing any any good for the patient. You have to change that treatment plan. And also, it's it's part of interventional electrophysiology. So what's the advantage of the SAP? Why it's so important or so, or why, when a wife's so, growing so fast now? Actually, the um, SSAPs or APs in general is the only, uh, the only test that can tell you, I mean, electrophysiologically speaking, it's the only test that can tell you if the, uh, the, can pick up the acute pathology that happens just in a matter, in a matter of seconds to minutes. Um, as you know, that EMG nerve conduction studies, you have to wait for the Wallerian degeneration to occur. So the acute, the really acute pathologies will be so hard to pick up. But and when it comes to SAPs, they can pick up the pathology right now. That there's a if there's, a, there's a, a, a lesion that occurred, and right now the SAPs will pick it up. Um, also, it can it it can give you a very quick look at the in the entire central center nerve system, which is really. Um, efficient when it comes to uh, time-saving procedures, especially in the ER department, as, we, as I'm going to explain to you in a second. Also, it's very, it's less expensive when it when it when it, it's come to, in comparison to MRIs or CAT scans with no radiation exposure, and also it serves a very good prognostic indicator for the patients if they are improving or no, as I'm going to show you in a, in, a, in 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 a second. So the only question, is it accurate or no? Actually, SAPs are really accurate when it comes to diagnosis of central nervous system pathology. And it, it's in, 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 in this study that I'm showing to you right now, it shows that SAPs were 100% sensitive when it comes to uh, um, diagnosing uh, MS. And it, it was 65% specific when it comes to the diagnosis, to establishing the diagnosis of MS. So basically, now there's a general agreement that there is very tiny lesions that can be missed in the MRI that can be picked up with SAPs and other way around. There's some small uh, lesion that can be missed with the evoked potential that can be picked up with the MRI. Um, so the procedure of the testing and how to do the procedure itself of SAPs, you have to first be familiar with the 1020 system. And um, it's actually that if you draw a vertical line from the nasium part of the skull back to the inion, and a, and a, and a, a vertical line from the nasium to the inion, and a, and a horizontal line from the periarticular areas, 
they will intersect at a point which is called CZ. If you go to fingerprint to the left, you'll find C4. If you go to the right, you will find C, uh, C3. If you go to the right, you will find C4. And all the way up, you will find the FZ, which is probably these are the three main points that we're going to use uh, uh, to access uh, the electrical, electrical impulses inside the somatosensory cortex. So the first recording, elect, active recording electrode will be in a C4 or C3 or C4 according to where, which side you're stimulating. And the second active recording will be in the, in the fifth cervical vertebrae. The reference will be in the FZ point and the stimulating, uh, stimulation intensity will be up to 50 milliamp, which is actually more than enough, but at the other, other text says it between 2.5 to 3 times the intensity needed to stimulate the sensory nerve. Other says that if, well, until you see a flicker contraction, all of them are true. Um, now, according to Harvard Medical School, they say if you use an intraspinal, uh, intraspinous needle, uh, uh, needle recording electrode and go through the intraspinous ligament, you, of course, with a careful, um, with a, with, with experiencing a lot of, of, you know, of care to the cord, to, to the dura and the subarachnoid space, if you can use the, the needle recording electrode when it comes to the spine, sometimes they use it also up here in the brain, to, you can get a better impulses or you, you can get a better amplitude. So what we are expe expecting to find, so when the impulse will travel up to the cord, inside the cervical medullary part, there, there will be a wave a wave will be produced called the N13, which is the first thing we look for. And then when it travels up to the thalamus, we, there's, a also, there's a, another part, which, another wave is produced called the N20. And the last wave called the P23 or P24 or P25 will be produced in the primary somatosensory cortex. The machine will, will, and the screen will give you these three waves and it will measure the time of conduction between each one. So there's a, what we call a CC time or central conduction time. It actually measures the conduction through this pathway and also what we call an IC timer, the intra, intracranial conduction time that also the machine will measure for you. So why we measure this time and what's the value of it? So it's actually really important because when there's a demyelinating disease like MS, for example, the conduction will be slow. So if we find a slowing of the conduction intracranially, that's a very strong evidence that we are de dealing with a demyelinating disease like MS, for example. So these are the waves. This, this is what you're going to see in your screen. You're going to see the N9 reflecting the, erp, the uh, uh, brachial plexus, N13 reflecting the cervical medullary or the, or, or the cord, and, we'll, and you'll see the N20, the P30, or the P25, or the P23 reflecting the primary somatosensory cortex. And this is also another picture for you to see the N20, the P25, the N13, and the N9. So what are we looking for actually? We're, we're actually looking for the absence of the wave, if the, of any absent wave. And we're looking for a latency problem or an amplitude difference from side to side. This is the normal value for the uh, latencies. And the N13 should, get, should, should come no later than 15.6 millisecond. The N20 should come no later than 21.2 millisecond. The CCT time should never, uh, the central conduction time should never be more than 6.8 millisecond between the N13 and the N20 or the N20 to the P25. Side to side difference should be not more than 1.2 millisecond and amplitude difference should not be more than 45 percentage. So now we're going to start to give you the first clinical example. This patient presented with a, a 33 year old male presented with a neck pain and all the EMG and nerve conduction testing was normal. But the patient also reported that for the last couple of weeks started having some visual dysfunction. So actually that, that make us start to suspect if the patient's having an upper motor neuron lesion. So the SEPs, if you can take a look here, as you can see, the N9, this is the left side of stimulation, this is the right side of stimulation. The N9 was normal on both sides, which, which is reflecting the brachial plexus. The N13 was normal on both sides, in both sides, which is, means that the, the cord is normal. And when it comes up to the N20, you can see in the left side that the intracranial conduction time between the cord to the cortex, or between the N13 to the N20, was normal, 6.3 millisecond, but it was 9.2 millisecond when it comes to the N20, and it was almost absent. I, I, it is like not, is not as recorded from the left side. 
9.2 millisecond means there's a demyelination across the from the cord up to the uh, to the primary somatosensory cortex. And when MRI to the brain was done, we find this black here in, 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 in the in the brain itself, which is consistent with MS. The second the clinical example we have is a 22-year-old patient presented to the emergency room with a head trauma after a motorcycle accident. For for, for SAPs to to know what's wrong with the um, um, with the center of the system. As you see, also the N9 is normal, which means that the brachial plexus was not injured. The C6 response, which is the N13, was normal, which means that the cord is also okay. But when we measured the bilateral cortical uh, uh, for, the, for th th the N20 for the thalamus and the P25 and 23 for the thalamocortic for the primary somatosensory cortex, they were absent in both sides. The MRI, MRI to that was done to the brain because we now we're sure that the cord is good and the brain complex is okay. Now we find this the 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 lesion with a global ischemia and the brain was found. And this is the third clinical example that we have with a 42-year-old female sat as post gunshot presented to the emergency department. Upon the arrival, five minutes later, the patient had a cardiac arrest, which is sustained for 10 minutes. And this is the SAP's findings just right after the cardiac arrest. And she, the the ER department, the ER physicians get her on a thoracotomy, and they they bring her back after ten minutes. But and the SAP was done like maybe ten to fifteen minutes after that. If you can see the N9 is kind of obtainable here, the the brachial plexus is kind of okay. Also the N14 or N13 for the cord is normal. But when you take a look at the N20 and you, and the P25, it is absent in both sides. So. Which is yeah, which is consistent with the cortical or the th 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 thalamus potentials and the cerebral, the primary spinal sensor cortex uh, uh, impulses was was abnormal on both sides and unobtainable with no response. So the interesting thing about this case is that 48 hours afterwards, after the the the, the patient starts to report some improvement and regain some control of her over her motion, so we we decided that we can redo the SAP after 48 hours and. It was really fast. We were really fascinated that we can see now an N20 and we can see a P23, in a, and and that actually was consistent with the improvement of the patient. So, bottom line, what I want to say here is SAPs is different, different from EMGs is that we are able to pick up acute lesions, up acute radiculopathies. If that happened just in a matter of days to to hours, even we can pick it up with SCPs, not just like EMGs. That's why it's using intraoperative monitoring. For example, if you see here the research in the Congress of Neurosurgical Surgeries, you can see that even now, median SEPs can be uh, used as an indicator for ischemia in case of aneurysm of the internal carotid artery, and they use it in intraoperative monitoring. So these are really sensitive uh, testing. They can pick up the early. Uh, uh, acute lesions, and um, it's obviously a very big topic, so we're going to have more, more videos expl to explain it, but uh, uh, till then, if you have any questions, just leave a comment below, and, and thank you for watching.